gonna see if I can make this work for myself. Uh, so yeah, my name is Jonathan McFedrin Waitzer, and I'm here as a trustee of the Waitzer Family Fund, and also as one of the co-organizers with a number of other amazing people, many of whom are in this room, of this conference's youth track. I'm gonna present some context for this panel, and then I'm gonna introduce the amazing panelists whose discussion I have the privilege of moderating today. Um, but before I do that, this being the Next Generation panel, we've decided to introduce some new technology into the session. Uh, we're using Slido. So if you could pull out your phones and go to slido.com and then enter the code PFC2018, what this will do is it will allow us to get questions from everyone in a more participatory, democratic way. You can actually see other people's questions and then vote on them so we can get a sense of which, which questions are really the most burning ones that everyone together cares about. Um, it's really cool. And so I'm gonna give you a second to log on and then just to, to test that it's working, uh, I'm gonna issue a, a, an invitation to anyone who's in there, um, you know, write something in. Like for example, if you wanted to write, I love your lipstick color, <laughs> you could throw that in there and we'll see if this is working. Hi, hi. <laughs> Hello. Nobody likes my lipstick? Thank you so much, oh my gosh. Okay, so we'll be coming back to this uh, during the panel discussion, and so it'll be open as we have, hear from our panelists, and, uh, and then we'll use it for the, the interactive part later. So, um, I'd like to open by bringing back some words shared by our earlier plenary speakers. We, we heard yesterday morning from Peggy Saye that there is no doubt that the future of philanthropy will be more bottom up. That's a major shift. And we, we heard the evening before from Michael Adams that major societal shifts occur through generational replacement. But I wonder, is this the only way that that can happen? Uh, on the phenomenal gender justice panel, Katya Iverson told us, youth are leading today, listen, learn, and take direction from them. And so I think the big question for this panel is can we make the shift towards bottom-up philanthropy through dialogue across generations and not have to wait for generational replacement? And so with that, uh, I'm going to call up our uh, wonderful panelists at the stage to take their seats, and then I'm gonna go through some uh, quick context setting presentation, and then we'll introduce ourselves and get into discussion. So, are these my slides? Great. So, where is this conversation coming from? Uh, last year was the first Youth Unconference on Philanthropy in Canada, and two days ago we had another one, twice as big, and yesterday we refined the ideas that came out of that through intergenerational dialogue circles. These ideas focused on what philanthropy does and how it does those things. We synthesized our discussion into some big takeaways and I've built this presentation around those points. And because it's synthesized from you know, stuff the last two days, it was done last night, so I may read a bit, I'm sorry. Uh, if a single core message emerged from these gatherings, it was this. Inequality is the defining challenge that philanthropy must address. So as Martin, Martin Luther King Jr. put it, philanthropy is commendable, but it must not cause the philanthropist to overlook the economic injustice that makes philanthropy necessary. In our conversations, the connection between economic injustice and philanthropy went deeper than that. We kept coming back to the roots of the wealth that philanthropy holds. Canadian philanthropy exists thanks to the accumulation and intergenerational transfer of private wealth, as we know. This accumulation was made possible by massive historical thefts of wealth from indigenous communities in the form of land, from black communities in the form of enslavement, which did happen here in Canada also, from poor communities through labor exploitation. Yeah, we get it. And so economic injustice doesn't just make philanthropy necessary, it's actually what made philanthropy in its current state possible. As Aaron Tanaka puts it, from an ethical and even spiritual perspective, we are left grappling with the position that the philanthropic dollars we manage are not our money. Now there's a more concrete side to the same issue, and this also really shaped our conversations. 
So philanthropy is often described as the use of private resources for public benefit. How accurate is that? In Canada, charitable donations are eligible for tax credits of up to 54%. This means that in many cases, more than half of the money that goes into philanthropy is directly removed from the public tax base. So in our society, it's actually sometimes more accurate to describe philanthropy as a system that privatizes decision making around the use of public resources. We grappled with these facts together. And grappling with these facts, it felt clear to us that our vision for philanthropy needed to go beyond what philanthropy prioritizes for funding and include how philanthropic decisions are made. We got excited, for example, about how when inequality is our focus, grant-making models can center lived experience and hand over actual power to marginalized communities, going beyond consultation and advisory processes. We also recognize the importance of who actually hold leadership roles on foundation staff teams and boards. And we asked ourselves, how much sense does it make for those of us who benefit most from today's runaway wealth inequality to be the ones making decisions about allocating resources to reverse that inequality? This brought us to a central reflection. Our, our generational lens isn't enough on its own to point us in the right direction for change. We need to make space for the communities that have been locked out of wealth accumulation across multiple generations. Black and indigenous communities first and foremost. And so if our framing around making space for young people takes us away from that focus, then that framing is actually a problem. Now, this vision for philanthropy is deeply grounded in ethics, for sure, but it's also just as much about strategy. Some of you are probably familiar with the iceberg of oppression model up here. It illustrates how individual acts of injustice are rooted in larger systems and institutions which are rooted in shared beliefs and values. Wealthy people, white people, settlers, we're, we're mostly up there in that ship. And these underlying systems are a lot harder for us to see clearly. So when it comes to strategizing around how to address the root causes of inequality, our perspective is hugely limited. Marginalized communities, grassroots social movements are often in that submarine. They see all of this very clearly. Philanthropy's imperative to give back control isn't just ethical. It's strategic, it's about impact. So these gatherings were, were about ideas, but they were also about building community. 70 people two days ago, 40 people a year ago, about 40 people yesterday. Our conversations evolved in going from ideas to community building from the ethical and the strategic actually towards the spiritual. Sorry if that's awkward, but it's true. From our starting point at the inequality imperative, we landed on solidarity as the core value that we wanted to build our community around. And this quote pretty much sums it up for us. If you have come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. At the same time, we reminded each other that recognizing this connectedness between us shouldn't mean we pay less attention to the huge differences in our access to power and resources. Connecting in solidarity means being fully accountable to those differences, not erasing them in sort of kumbaya. So where did all this land? Millennials love memes, right? So here we go. We started by recognizing that the dominant notion of philanthropy that many of us receive from our parents' generation is pretty inadequate. We came up with another one, centering inequality as philanthropy's defining challenge. We explored the ethical and strategic imperatives to, for philanthropy to give back control to communities that are most impacted by inequality, and we got real about what it means to create community across major differences in power and privilege. So that's the summary. And now, here we are. We almost certainly don't all agree with everything I just said, and that is more than okay. In terms of how we manage that, though, I'd like to share something that I learned while working as a management consultant with McKinsey & Company. It's a firm that's built on a clear set of core values, and one of them is critical feedback is a gift. It helps us grow. Now, because of the power dynamics in philanthropy, many of us are insulated from hearing truly critical feedback most of the time. 
We have three incredible women on stage who are here to share their gifts of critical feedback in order to help this field grow. But when we're not used to hearing it, even the most caring critical feedback can feel like an attack sometimes. Receiving critical feedback as a gift is a muscle. We need to exercise it. So if we find ourselves feeling defensive, I'd like to challenge all of us in this session to sit with that discomfort, recognize how much work it takes to share critical feedback in a room like this in particular, and respond as much as we can with gratitude. So that's the, the summary of where this is coming from. I'm now going to let you all know who we have on this stage. Rudena Bahubeshi is the Stakeholder Engagement and Communications Manager at the Inspirit Foundation. Lindsay Dupre is a board member at Canada Roots, Canadian Roots Exchange, a youth advisor for the Ontario Indigenous Youth Partnership Project, an amazing innovation in philanthropy in and of, its of itself, and the Indigenous Education Liaison at the Ontario Institute for the Studies and of Study of Education, sorry. And Hilary Pearson, of course, is the president of PSC and our host for this week. So if we could get a huge round of applause, please, for our three panelists. So, we wanted to open up uh, this conversation, hearing from all three of our panelists on a big question that emerged from yesterday. It became clear that regardless of generation, we all believe that philanthropy needs to change. And at the same time, clearly there are, there are different priorities for that change across generations. And so, my, my opening question for, for our three panelists is I'd love to hear what kinds of change do you think, what kinds of visions for philanthropy do you think young people are most excited about? And to what extent do those visions jive? To what extent are we on the same page across generations? And to, to what extent are we not on the same page? And I'm gonna invite Lindsay to start us off. Sure. I'm also, uh, I'm gonna take my role as a youth in this space very seriously and try and bring some energy. So I'm gonna get up and move around a little bit. Um, I, in my work with these organizations that John mentioned, as well as um, some of the different youth organizing initiatives I've done within my community, I'm Métis, um, I'm working with other Indigenous young people, energy is so important. And I think after a few days of being at a conference, you might be feeling a little bit tired. So I'm going to do my best to share some of what I have with you. Um, to also share a little bit more about who I am, I just mentioned I'm Métis. My family is um, originally from Red River area, and um, my mother's family, that's my father's family, my mother's family are Irish settlers. And so my identity is huge in the work that I do, especially as I take up positions of leadership and as an Indigenous young person. And so um, conceptualizing and making sense of what um, whiteness and power and privilege means within my own body and the work that I do is so critical. So um, as John said, we, we want to open this space and to say that critical feedback is part of moving this sector forward. And um, I would say that it's important that we take that critical feedback personally because we are talking about ourselves as individuals as, as individuals, but also um, more generally at looking at uh, the sector and the greater systems that are happening in Canada. Um, as a young person, I also take it very seriously to teach you some lingo. So critical feedback is one way to put it. Another way to put it is spilling the tea. Has anyone heard that before? Yes, some excitement over there, okay. So we are going to try and help do that and spill some more tea. And um, again, I invite you to take it, to let it sit and carry it with you as you leave, but not to get um, shut down or defensive um, because I promise that I share this information with love and with hope for what we can do together. So for me, when we think about um, this work of philanthropy, I get very frustrated, to be honest, lately because what we're seeing happening is these buzzwords. So, um, I don't know across all of your organizations, all of your foundations, um, how often reconciliation, diversity, inclusion, indigenization, decolonization, 
um, how often these words come up. But as an Indigenous young person, I can tell you that every space I'm in, I'm constantly flooded with that jargon. And those words carry a lot of power and potential. And they come from movements. For example, everything that has gone on in our Indigenous movements towards justice, to have these things be on the table. I am so proud and grateful for my community and leaders who have fought so hard for that. But what's happened, including within this sector, has been these words, these buzzwords, have become just that, buzzwords. And they've been appropriated to where now, when Indigenous young people are interacting with them, they're not even what we envision them in the first place. So for me, I've seen reconciliation become more about further centering whiteness and about how Indigenous people should feel lucky to be able to share our stories, to be able to um, do work that ends up just supporting the image of different organizations. And again, that's not just in the philanthropic sector. That's across nonprofit. I work in academia as well. It's happening there. And it's something I want us to pay attention to. So it's not to say that we can't use these words, but I want us to think very, very intentionally in how they're being used, why they're being used, and who is using them. And the last part of my spilling the tea to open us up is to throw a different word at you, and that is justice. That is the word that indigenous young people, black young people, and other young people of color are talking about in our circles, where just as much discussion about change in our communities and allocation of resources is happening. And that's a word that I don't want to get appropriated because justice means something. You know, we're in a time where Indigenous young people are still being reminded that our lives don't matter. Recent court cases and murders that are happening in this country at a time where more than ever we're being told that reconciliation and relationships with our communities are the most important ones. So a lot of us are getting really frustrated and tired of that. And we're still doing the work that we're doing, but we're getting a little bit frustrated and saddened and just tired out by constantly having to play within this realm of these buzzwords and people who think they're doing work and good work, and maybe sometimes we are, but it's not in line with how we were hoping to do it in the first place. So think about justice. What is the role of this sector in advancing justice for indigenous peoples, for black peoples, and other marginalized groups in this country? I think, as I finish off, thinking about who's in this room right now, if we're looking to the future, we should be thinking about how maybe fa family foundations shouldn't exist. Maybe that's the goal. Or maybe the priorities of the work that you're doing have to drastically shift if we are actually trying to advance justice. So think about that and think about the ways that you're using these words because they mean a lot to our communities and the relationships that you have with us are something that we take very, very seriously beyond just dollars. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, and thank you for setting us up with a really broad frame. Um, I think that you're, you're setting up Rodena really beautifully to uh, speak to the specific experiences of, of being inside philanthropy um, and of, uh, of really bringing this perspective on youth and other excluded perspectives within philanthropy to the fore. I don't have to hold the mic? Okay, great, because that's awkward for me. <laughs> um, hi, folks. How's everybody doing? <laughs> All right, pretty good. Um, yeah, I'm just uh, I'm thinking about what Katya said yesterday, that you know, if you are going to remember something, you have to hear it three times, which I think is great, because I'm actually building on a lot of what other folks are saying, but also hopefully bringing uh, some more to the conversation. Um, and I'm really grateful for this opportunity, uh, this plenary, um, because I think we were having a really rich conversation in the, in the Youth Unconference, and that's actually um, only truly fruitful for also all talking to, to each other and together. So I appreciate that. 
Um, so when I think of intergenerational philanthropy, what I'm really focused and thinking about is uh, the future of philanthropy. So yes, that might look like bringing um, younger people into the room, but I think we're also not only talking about age. Um, so I think we can say this out loud in this sector that things need to look different. Uh, in addition to having young people, I think we need to have more racialized people, more trans people, queer people, disabled people, and ultimately people of different economic backgrounds in decision-making tables. And fundamentally, whether it's about labor, climate change, healthcare, or the arts, the work needs to be grounded in equity and justice. Like Lindsay, I'm very much focused on uh, justice more than anything else. Because who can access these opportunities and who is most affected by these issues is really uh, an important question across all of these areas of work within philanthropy. So we kicked off the Youth On Conference naming the connections of wealth and unequal access to wealth uh, and connecting that to colonialism, to the seizure of land, to slavery, and to parts of our past and present that affect where we are today. Um, and I think it's really important to understand that particular communities have not simply been left behind in accruing resources, but have been strategically pushed out. And I think for me, it's helpful to remind myself of this um, because we're not necessarily just doing good work or kind work, but we're actually doing something that's a responsibility, that is a responsibility on all of us and um, a realization that resources need to absolutely be shifted. So what does doing things differently in the future of philanthropy look like? I think we often hear that it's about looking around the table and seeing who's there and who's missing and advocating for ensuring that those people are there. And we heard this at the conference yesterday as well on our last plenary. I think it's absolutely the right instinct, but in addition to that, I'd also say, what room are you giving those people at the table? and who is leaving the table. Don't get me wrong, it's critical that we all work together, but the future of leadership needs to look different. So if we talk about, like yesterday, the majority of our leadership being men, we must also talk about the majority of our leadership being white, being able-bodied, and also falling into traditional um, gender binaries. So John, uh, in their slide, touched on um, philanthropy as solidarity, which I think is a really brilliant idea. And for solidarity, I think we often think about people standing side by side, and just as much, I think it can also look like getting out of the way. So I ask, when you are opening up that table, whether seeking new and different leadership or creating an advisory group, how fulsome is that space you're making for reimagining? If we're on the same page, which I think we are, about being in the midst of some of the most serious and urgent social inequalities, then I think we're also talking about a need for some pretty radical changes. And those aren't going to only be solved by representation and diversity in our organizations, while the other ways of working stay mostly the same. To solve our urgent problems, I think we need people with lived experience at the table with deep connections to communities to be in, uh, communities that we want to be in meaningful relationship with. And then I also think it's about creating that space for reimagining our structures and um, what we are fundamentally doing. So I think that includes asking some questions, some hard questions, and some of the ones I'm thinking about are, are we working to a future where we no longer exist? And do we have any sense of when that might be? To what extent are we willing to open ourselves up to communities we hope to serve? Are they directing our strategic priorities and plans? Are they adjudicating our grants? What is the intention we're working with? Is it about creating equitable, positive change? Or is it just as much about creating family legacy? And when are those things in competition with one another? So do we really, for example, need to create a new fund or foundation, or can we support existing uh, initiatives. So I think about initiatives like the Indigenous-led granting organization, the Ontario Indigenous Youth Partnership Project. Is it more meaningful to just shift resources to existing initiatives like that rather than starting new funds and foundations? 
So I have a lot of questions, <laughs> which I'm not necessarily gonna provide answers for, but I think this is a really part, critical part of the conversation together when we're talking about intergenerational leadership. Driving at those questions that might make us somewhat uncomfortable and that we also acknowledge we don't necessarily have the answers to yet, but I think it's that first critical step we need to take together. So hopefully we can continue to do that on this panel. Thank you. So I have another piece of youth lingo to share, building on Lindsay, um, which is uh, hashtag cool mom. comes from the movie Mean Girls. And uh, I thought of it just now because I'm, I was reflecting on how lucky we are on this panel to have Hillary Pearson joining us to share this bird's eye perspective um, and to engage openly with care with, with these critical ideas that are, that are emerging. Um, and to help all of us in this room grow and learn from that. And so, yeah, cool mom, for sure. <laughs> and, and, I'd um, like to invite you, and I'd like to invite you, Hillary, to, to share some of your thoughts. Okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> my, uh, my thought right now is, geez, I wish my 26-year-old were here. You know, <laughs> she would be, uh, Surprised. <laughs> but thank you very much, John. I appreciate that, and I'll try and live up to the spirit of that. Uh, and, and I also, I, I do want to mention there, there was uh, intended to be another panelist on this, uh, mm -hmm. on this group, another wonderful woman, uh, Sophie Gupta, uh, who is not here with us, uh, and who very much wanted to be and is part of these conversations. Uh, she, of course, is a, a representative to the, to the extent that we made this a representational panel at all, and I, I think we're trying to avoid representing uh, fully uh, either the generations or the types of people within philanthropy, but Sophie was going to play the role of the family foundation younger generation. To some degree, you do that, John, and uh, um, I'm not going to try and fulfill that role because um, I'm not young. Uh, I don't know how that happened, but. I'm not, uh, but I'm cool, and I'm a mom, yes. <laughs> I'll admit to both of those. Uh, so, you know, I want to try and um, reflect a bit on what we've been hearing over the last day and a half, and, uh, and, and how um, I have been looking at it from my generational perspective, and I'll say right up front that I'm a baby boomer, uh, and so I'm a good 40 years on from you. Uh, and I guess that gives me some perspective, but I've also tried to be, uh, to, to try and listen as I grow older, not to lose touch with new ideas, new perspectives, what's coming, uh, because I think it is actually what keeps me young. And I, by the way, have an 87-year-old mom who's about to be 88, and she's almost the youngest person I know. Some of you know her too, and uh, she has always been very focused on, on uh, young people. She has worked for children's rights all her life. She has been committed to that cause, and she is young. Uh, she connects to young people. She talks to young people. She is uh, curious, and she is open to ideas, and, and I think that that's crucial. So. Although the generations, uh, we have age, uh, you know, to differentiate us, we, aren't not, we are not necessarily different, uh, as long as we are curious and open to, to ideas and listening, uh, and changing our minds, you know, every now and then. Uh, I want to talk a bit about the sort of frame, uh, and partly the, the, the frame that John brought in which I think came out of the Youth Unconference, the conversation about inequality and about the importance of inequality as a, a theme in, and a focus in philanthropy. Uh, and I agree, I agree. I think that philanthropy uh, can certainly be framed as an effort to address the most central problem in our society. Uh, when I hear someone like Darren Walker at the Ford Foundation take that very venerable institution and try and shift it so that all of the work of Ford, and in fact, not just the work, but the way in which Ford works, uh, to, to shift that to inequality and to questioning what inequality means and how, as a 
philanthropic institution for it should address inequality. That's a very crucial change. Uh, Darren Walker has been criticized. Uh, he himself comes from inequality. He is uh, a man who grew up poor, who grew up black, who grew up uh, in the American South, um, who certainly did not come from privilege, who is leading a privileged institution. And he is, um, he is, in that sense, he's been criticized because no matter what his background, he occupies now a position of privilege. And therefore to say that he is, and that the institution he leads is going to focus on inequality in itself becomes uh, a, a provocative statement and, and one that he is, um, uh, one, that, one that he is criticized for and continues to be criticized for. Uh, the paradox of philanthropy is that it does come from inequality. I would acknowledge that. Uh, it comes from wealth. It comes, therefore, from the fact that some people have wealth and others do not. Uh, and, therefore, uh, the thought that philanthropy coming from inequality can successfully focus on and do something about inequality seems paradoxical and to be critiqued. One could also reframe it as from opportunity to opportunity. People who have created foundations have had opportunity. They may themselves have come from nothing and they have been able to get something. So they've had an opportunity to pull together resources for themselves and they have chosen and I don't want to lose track of this in philanthropy, they have chosen to be generous. They have chosen to give it back in some way. And they have chosen in many cases to do it because they want to create opportunity for others. So from opportunity to opportunity. I think that's a, a framing of philanthropy that is as um, fair in its way as from inequality to inequality. And perhaps more hopeful. I think that's important too. Uh, I, I'm conscious of the fact that I, I have to uh, give more time back to John. I have many things I want to say, um, but in the spirit of the, the three things that we will say first and that we will then say over and over again over the course of this uh, conversation, let me just put three ideas out there and then I will come back to them in our, in our conversation. And one of them is disruption. So we are, we are hearing a lot about disruption and I'm glad at this conference we should be talking about disruption Disruption is in philanthropy. It's coming to, it is here in philanthropy. And so we should acknowledge that and understand that. Disruption. And the second thing is risk. Uh, from this somewhat chaotic situation that disruption creates, uh, there is also risk. Risk for organizations, foundations that are feeling disrupted and threatened. Uh, how do you deal with that, with the risk of no longer existing, possibly. Uh, but how do you also take risk in challenging in this context of disruption? How do you challenge structures? How do you challenge relationships? How do you challenge what you're doing, going beyond what you are comfortable doing? So this question of courage, too. And then lastly, aspiration. I want it to be, I want to think about something hopeful here. Disruption, risk, but also aspiration that we, I think, and intergenerationally, we can work together aspirationally. I think that we can be better at what we do, at what we fund, at who we hear, at who we bring to the table, at the results we accomplish. Uh, and that aspiration is shared across the generations. I'm, I'm certain of that, positive about that. That sense of you know, giving opportunity is also an aspirational idea. John. Thank you. So can we get a round of applause for all three of our panelists, please? I want to particularly thank uh, Lindsay for setting us up with the, the really important frame of, of justice and responsibility as, as being ultimately more important than, than generosity because it's something we can be held accountable to. And if we're, if we're going to share this vision of philanthropy, with society as, as, a, as a whole, then we need to be able to be held accountable. Um, and I want to thank Rudena for your incredibly insightful and, and fruitful questions around sort of where we can go 
with that, with entanglement specifically. And then, and then Hillary for framing this, to bring it back to, to growth, the growth mindset and the, and the opportunity. Um, and I, I'm gonna pick up on that and uh, look at this question that we have from Danny around, are there any funders out there that are truly shifting resources and power to marginalized people? Examples of equity and justice in philanthropy. And, and we know that there are. Um, and there are a number of people in this room who are, who are at, the, at the leading edge of, of doing this work. Um, and then there's a number of things that are happening outside of this room, outside of this country. Um, and so I'd love to ask each of the three of you to share, you know, what, what is one thing that you are really excited about in philanthropy that points the way to where, where you think we need to go? Um, and I'm gonna start with Lindsay because I know you have one and I really wanna hear about it. Sure. Um. Yeah, I have, I have one in particular that I'll focus on um, in being involved with the Ontario Indigenous Youth Partnership Project. Um, that is an incredible initiative that I am so grateful to be a part of. Um, and um, I think the most important thing to know about OIP is that we really are stepping forward and as you mentioned, like uh, working aspirationally, taking risks, and doing this work in new ways so that we can model. Um, indigenous young people outside of this sector are doing a lot of this work um, and we're doing it without resources all of the time. Um, so our collective, our group, OIP, is focused on meeting indigenous young people where we are at in the work that we're doing anyways and being there to provide additional resources which is monetary resources, but it's also love, it's also um, capacity building, it's also patience and time, and doing that through uh, approaches that are based in reciprocity and values that um, are huge parts of our cultures as Indigenous young people. So some of the things that we're doing that I think it can help influence maybe the work that you're doing in your foundations, um, again, are around patience and flexibility. So um, as someone who has navigated a lot of different funding structures and opportunities to do the work that I try and do, uh, I get very frustrated as someone who is quite educated. I have a master's of social work degree, first person in my family to go to university. And so I hold that privilege as well. And even myself navigating grant applications and um, different funding spaces, I've had a hard time. So then I think about my friends, my family and community members in remote communities um, who maybe don't have all of the same, and not just remote communities, in urban centers as well, um, who don't have all of the same privileges and access opportunities as I do. Um, how, are, how are they able to do that to get what they need? Um, and so what OIP is doing is we're maintaining a way of meeting youth where they're at, um, building off of the strengths that they hold, and in a case-by-case -case basis, adjusting our levels of supports according to that. And that's not to say that you can't have a standard um, model or structures for how some of your processes can work, but it's about taking those risks to be flex flexible and to adjust to those unique realities. Um, and lastly, I'll mention about OIP, I said love. And you know, sometimes you hear people say that, especially speakers, and it can seem so um, fluffy or surface level or whatever. Um, but as an indigenous young person in this country who again is fighting injustice um, alongside my peers and my family and community, I will tell you that love is what is allowing Indigenous young people to keep going and to do the work that we're doing in ways that are sustainable and meaningful. Love is one of the most powerful ways that we are addressing injustice and it's opening up possibilities um, in the work that we're doing. And so if you can learn from that and learn from OIP's model or support us in the work that we're doing as we grow, uh, I think it's an incredible approach that will help us shift the direction of the sector. Thank you. Um, I want to bring one, one quick uh, nugget of, of insight that came out of the unconference and that really connects to what you just shared, Lindsay. Mm -hmm. um, so we had a number of participants from the Vision 2020 cohort, uh, which is a, a group of, of young philanthropists that the Toronto Foundation has convened. Um, and it's a, a very racially diverse group, which is very unusual for young philanthropists, um, philanthropists in general, less unusual for young philanthropists, but still. Um, and 
they shared reflections around how important it is to, again, who's at the table and who's in leadership, and that they had gotten feedback when they went on, on grantee visits from grantees they visited that like it felt so different to be in conversation with a group that wasn't just a group of all white people, but mostly, mostly racialized people, um, in terms of the questions they asked, in terms of the, the energy they brought, and that you know, building that trust between grantee and funder, and, and making the process accessible, as you were talking about, has, you know, there are certain things that we can do in terms of shifting our practices, and there are certain things that can only happen when we shift who's in charge. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for sharing that. And, and Rudena, I wanna, I wanna hear about what, what you're excited about. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear more about OYIP, and I think that's such a great example, so I appreciate uh, the unpacking of that. Um, and yeah, also just like sitting with uh, um, what you were saying, Hilary, I agree. I don't think it's about, uh, I think it can be helpful, I agree. And um, so, yeah, that example being absolutely a hopeful one as well. And I think it's important to remind ourselves as well that equity is not necessarily like a finished product, like to, to look at an organization that's doing it right. I think it's recognizing that it's a process and it's an accountability and it's being called to that accountability and responding to it in meaningful ways. Um, so I think uh, at Inspirit Foundation, um, some of the ways we're trying to do this is uh, like working really closely with our grantees and also making sure that our different grants are adjudicated by um, their peers. So for instance, with our change up grant, um, that is a uh, grant for 18 to 34 year olds, uh, $10,000. Um, an organization of course focused on uh, advancing inclusion and addressing discrimination based ra on race, religion, ethnicity, and so the grant being focused on that as well, and also uh, focused on people with lived experience of those issues, um, and then the decision making being held by young people who fit that description of being racialized, indigenous, Muslim, who are determining where those grants go. Um, and I think of that process of getting in, and I think it's so critical. I'm seeing more conversations amongst our foundations about how do we simplify uh, our application process? How do we share applications with one another? Um, we're even talking about uh, creating a more similar application with a few foundations so that you know when granting season comes up it seems to all we always seem to be doing grants at the same time for some reason um, that some of those questions are similar to try and you know take back the burden of work or how do we uh, let folks share a draft with us or do it over the phone or how do we um, so finding those ways of trying to uh, decrease those barriers to access points as much as possible amazing thank you um, that really brings up for me, again, going back to this, this question of you know, the, the leadership transition and, and making space that one thing we, we heard from, from the young conference is that yes, we, we do need new institutions in philanthropy. We, we need institutions that are themselves led by and created by uh, the communities that are most impacted by inequality. And in the meantime, there's so many things that we can do within our existing institutions to still get out of the way, as you said and to still, to still create space for sharing of power, seating of power, and you know, creating granting committees, for example, mm -hmm. that, are, that, are, that are led by uh, people with lived experiences, led by young people, is, is one way to create those, those pockets of equitable philanthropy within our existing institutions as hopefully we move to a larger transition. So thank you. Hillary, what are you excited about? Uh, so being, uh, being someone who uh, tends to think uh, on a daily basis about practices and processes, a little less exciting, I admit, but, but crucial. Uh, I, I'm excited actually about the possibilities offered uh, to foundations today to, to break down the, the wall around the foundation. Uh, you know, and this is happening at a much faster pace now. Uh, I, I uh, saw it coming, um, but I am now actually seeing uh, results uh, happening much more quickly. And by that I mean specifically both uh, digital uh, tools that are allowing uh, organizations that, and families that are otherwise fairly closed to make themselves more transparent and to uh, reach out and collect information from others. And that, that is really important. Uh, you know, I think that uh, we who did not grow up in the digital age 
uh, are still pretty excited about what digital technologies offer. You know, those of you who are living in it uh, may not appreciate just how big a transformation it's been. It's, it's been huge. You know, I can still remember uh, working in a bank which did not, it was not connected to the internet, and this is not that long ago. You know, we did not have email, we were not connected to the internet, uh, and we actually had to either phone each other or go see each other to communicate internally, uh, <coughs> let alone externally. You know, the possibilities now for having tremendous reach and, and uh, access to information and also an ability to share it uh, and therefore to be inspired by it um, and to get to have uh, new ideas that are formed from this information that's coming in uh, and that you can share out quickly. That is huge and I do want to underline that because again, it's not something that if you have grown up within it, you appreciate as being as transformational as it is. And it does lead to, uh, again, this, this sort of opening up to uh, ideas around uh, processes, for example, participatory grant making. I mentioned that earlier. and. Uh, Participatory grant making is still a relatively new concept. Most of you have, have not really explored it yet, um, but it is made possible by technologies and by this, this breaking down of the walls. You know, the, the foundation is not just that little group that of people that are working together and getting together once every three or four months to make decisions. It's much more than that. It's much more porous. And participation means really engaging with beneficiaries and community partners in a way that just wasn't possible even 10 years ago. Thank you. Um, so I'm looking at the questions that are coming in, and I'm seeing a bit of a trend. Uh, there seems to be some appetite to move from talking about the, we, we sort of started with the why. Why are we focusing on inequality? Why focus on uh, the need to center inequality and return power? We've talked a bit about the what, like what can this look like? And I see a lot of questions about the how. Um, around how those of us who are either in a family, fa in, in a family uh, and looking to engage with other family members or non-family members on family foundation boards, uh, how do we engage across generations, across differences of opinion with, you know, if, if we're feeling, oops, if, uh, if, if, if we're feeling challenged, where can, we, where can we go to sort of help ourselves move forward if, if we're looking to bring other folks along? What are, the, what are the barriers that you see to moving this agenda forward, and, and what do you see as like the enabling factors? I'm gonna open it up to any of you that wants to share some wisdom around how. Sure, I will, I will go for it. Um, I think in terms of a barrier, something that I'm learning, and actually from one of our planning calls, um, something that Hillary mentioned was, um, you know, there's extra dynamics at play here that I'm also unfamiliar with when family foundations are working with young people within your own families. And so you can talk about involving young people in, in this work in different ways, but there's also extra challenges that come from um, family dynamics. So putting that out there. And so I can make a recommendation on how to incorporate Indigenous young people, but those practices may look different from how you bring the young people in your own families and your own um, lives along with you. Um, so while I can't speak to all the solutions around that, I want to at least acknowledge that. It's something that I think um, is at play here. Um, if we do want to have more spaces and I think that are inclusive, um, as much as I'm challenged by that word sometimes, um, I think a key part is also going back to what you said about the foundations of philanthropy being tied to colonialism and injustice. So you mentioned, um, you mentioned that exploitation um, of labor, um, extraction of wealth through land from indigenous peoples and enslavement of black people. And so this exploitation of labor in particular, I think is something for us to think about. And these key pieces are not just a thing of the past, but in um, our current realities. And also part of my tea spilling is that colonialism is ongoing and we are implicated within these processes. Um, and so again, getting back to the how of what we do now in the, in the spaces that we have, I think you have to be conscious of the ways that maybe those things are still happening. 
and when it comes to exploitation of labor, um, when you're looking to involve indigenous young people uh, in particular, it needs to be recognized that a lot of us are doing this work and we're providing advising, we're providing expertise for free. And we're doing that on top of taking care of our families, of our communities, we're leading projects. I, I'm very fortunate that I have a full-time job at the University of Toronto, but I know a lot of my peers who aren't fortunate enough to have that as a fallback to pay rent. So it seems like something small, but it comes up time and time again when I talk with my peers that when you're looking for how to bring us into your spaces, really um, appreciate the expertise that we're bringing and compensate us accordingly so that we can actually participate in those spaces in fair ways so that we're not further being exploited in the process. Thank you. <clears throat> Dana or Hillary, either of you wanna? On the question of barriers? Or yeah, how? <laughs> how do we get there? I think probably there was momentary silence here because it's such a big question. <laughs> you know, it's like, how do you get into this question? Uh, and there are many different ways of getting into the question. Uh, I think um, I'd like to address maybe uh, a point that was made, um, I think it was by, by Lindsay originally, and, and I was going to uh, also comment on it, which is uh, the idea that, that structures are not static and that, in fact, we are living in such a disruptive age that we could foresee a, a time when, in fact, there were no foundations anymore. Uh, I actually read a, an article called, you know, I went to the future and there were no foundations there. Uh, you know, it's, it's something to think about, you know, why are foundations themselves uh, forms that we, that we stick with or that we think are going to be perpetual? Uh, you know, I, I think actually even the word perpetuity now in, in in relation to foundations is, um, is, is probably not a good word. Uh, and it, because I'm not sure that it has meaning. Uh, uh, things are changing very quickly, as we know. Uh, you know, the, the idea certainly of having a long-term view of being able to depend on resources that are not going to vanish tomorrow and that therefore give you the chance to uh, tackle problems over a long period of time uh, and often social problems and, and complex problems, and not just, when I use the word social, I mean broadly. Uh, you know, they, they could include uh, environmental issues, uh, you know, the impact of climate change, uh, and other kinds of issues that, that uh, are going to change the quality of life or in some way affect the quality of life for people uh, across this country, and, and that require complex solutions, and maybe over long periods of time. You know, our foundations as uh, organizations that have independent resources, which are probably going to be around for some period of time, is that a good thing? Do we want to continue to have that kind of organization and the people associated with it? Yes, I think, yes. Uh, we have to make the case for it, though. And I can see that in a disruptive age, the impulse to simply blow it all up and say, you know, foundations are things of the past, uh, you know, that's a, that's a strong impulse. Uh, and you know, in the United States, uh, certainly we've seen among the young tech uh, philanthropists uh, this idea that you don't want to start a foundation, you actually want to start a collection of organizations if you want to intervene, if you want to have social impact, if you want to do something ambitious, if you want to tackle big issues, uh, that you're going to have a range of forms that you work in, whether they are nonprofits, social enterprises, charitable foundations, or other. And it might well be that that's the kind of mix we see in the future. Uh, I, I'm not just so sure that it's the form that is important in, in the how question. Um, it may be more in the approach uh, and the ways in which people are working with each other in a kind of collaborative uh, approach that is most important. And again, I go back to the possibilities that are offered by the tools we have, technology and other things that allow us really to connect with each other in ways that actually also erase problems of power and privilege and difference. You know, talking to somebody in a, in a, um, through social media, you know, you, you are not, the, presumably the biases that you have when you look at someone and when you make all those unconscious assumptions about who that person is and where they're coming from and what they have to say. 
um, that's a positive, you know, that those are erased. That's also a negative. We all know that social media can lead to uh, abuse and to um, all kinds of very negative things. Um, but I remain hopeful about that. Thank you. Um, and I want to hear from you, Verdana. Yeah, what, are, what are your thoughts um, around just how? Briefly, yeah. Well, it's interesting because I'm thinking about what you were saying earlier, Hillary, in terms of this need uh, to, you know, be porous and make sure there isn't a wall around us. Because hearing that question, I'm also thinking about how. Um, so I entered the sector just under two years ago, and I think I was really blown away at last year's conference because this was like a very unknown world for me, uh, which was a great opportunity. And so I think about how we can continue to open up those walls because I think um, I think some of us are engaging in uh, you know trying to uh, be more participatory, more open, and. More but I, I, from the outside, would not have known that two years ago, not entering the sector. Like, uh, I know that a lot of foundations are, you know, unlisted, more proactive. Um, so just, I think, just, just taking down those walls and more transparency about it, I think, could go a, a long way to uh, understanding what the possibilities are of those shifts from, you know, hearing from beneficiaries and things like that. Because uh, I think our sector still feels a lot more opaque than we think it does. Um, uh, I think there are a lot of exciting changes that are happening and a lot of efforts people are making to be transparent on the site about, or other entry points for information about how decisions get made, where the money comes from and all these things. I think continuing to move in that direction would be really helpful to understanding how these new tradition transitions come about and how we can engage in them together. Love that. Thank you. Yeah, if we're, if we're talking about accountability then, a precursor to accountability is transparency. Mm -hmm. um, I want to add one, one thought ar around how, uh, which relates to some of the opening words that, that I shared and, and a big theme of the unconference and the youth track as a whole being sort of the way that we relate to each other and the way that we, we hold ourselves through discomfort. Um, I think that one thing that we need to do in this response to some of the questions around uh, how to engage with uh, younger Family Foundation members, I think that we, we, we being, sorry, uh, I like to say speak from the I or define the we, so when I say we, speaking right now on behalf of we being uh, people with privilege, with access to philanthropic resources, I think we need to hold each other uh, through discomfort, through learning, and make sure that we are, you know, what, whatever steps we're able to take in learning from the wisdom of folks who see more of the iceberg, we need to make sure that we are proactively sharing as much of that as we can with each other and not feeling sort of complacent that we've taken a step and we need, to, we need to take on some of that burden of, of education for each other, and especially knowing that learning through challenge and discomfort and you know, it triggers fragility, we often feel attacked, even though the feedback may have been actually presented with a lot of care, um, it's messy work. And so to find spaces where uh, we can do that work with each other, organize each other, but then also to go, come back to solidarity to make sure that those spaces are transparent and accountable to the folks who don't have access to those spaces. Feels like a, another really important piece, I think. Um, and we are coming up on the, the end of our time together, and I think we have just enough time for maybe final thoughts from, from each of you before we close. I'm wondering if there's, going from the, the why, through the what, through the how, anything that feels like it hasn't yet been said in terms of a a really exciting example or a, a crucial next step, a barrier we haven't explored? Again, that, that, that huge questions here, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so easy to address all this. Um, you know, this is, I think this has been said in a few of the plenary panels that we've had already at the conference, you know, that um, it's a journey. Uh, you know, all of this is, uh, is going to take time. I know that, and this is a difference between the generations, uh, the younger generation is impatient, and understandably so. You know, it's, it's young people are revolutionaries. I mean, if you're not going to be a revolutionary when you're young, when are you going to be a revolutionary? Um, there are some old revolutionaries too, but on, in general, as we get older, um, we tend to see more of the reasons why we should wait or be more patient, or that we know that things will happen over time, and that sometimes, you know, if you are patient, you're going to see the results that you are more anxious for when you're younger. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, unfortunately, inequalities lasted a long time and therefore uh, I think our, 
our patience uh, around the work to address inequality has also got to be very long. Um, and, and I also understand that it's easy to get discouraged when you're feeling impatient for change and you don't see it happening fast enough um, that you can get discouraged and feel frustrated and, and look for reasons why you're not seeing it and, and feel angry about that. And, you know, it's legitimate to feel all those things too. I think um, one can feel angry at almost any age about, you know, the fact that that the issues are still there and that they're still so complicated and that so many people are suffering and that, you know, there's still such a, a, a huge set of, of things that philanthropy has to do and has to address. It doesn't seem to ever get better, but it does actually, it does get better. Uh, we've seen, you know, some of the uh, uh, comments that were made this morning by Caroline, uh, you know, it, it, you, if you wait long enough, you begin to see the evidence that things are, are going to, are, bet, are getting better or that the intervention is working um, and that you can keep moving forward. Um, I guess it, I wanted to pick up on something Sandy Houston said. Uh, he referred to this in, in passing at, at the opening plenary. He was talking about a piece by David Brooks in the New York Times. Uh, Brooks was commenting on uh, the Hidden Tribes, uh, the book that's just come out that tries to categorize uh, Americans in terms of their, their, uh, their beliefs and their um, uh, the, the sort of ideological convictions that they might have. And he talked about the exhausted majority. Uh, and at the end of David Brooks's piece, which I really recommend, I think it's an interesting column, uh, he says maybe there's a new political paradigm that will emerge, that it's not all uh, anger, division, defeat, uh, polarization, civil war, uh, in the United States, that, that we can have hope around a, a new political paradigm. Um, and I thought actually that it was a, a paradigm that could also be used in, in philanthropy. And I'll just quote it, uh, you know, again, full credit to David Brooks. He said, you know, we, we hope to see a new paradigm emerging, a new, in my sense, philanthropy paradigm based on abundance, not deficits, on gifts, not fear and on hope, not hatred. And I think that if philanthropy can hold on to that, that's very, um, that's very inspirational. And I think we, we can feel courage to go forward. Thank you. Beautiful closing thoughts. Lindsay, Rodena, closing thoughts to Rock, share. Rock, paper, scissors. No, okay. <laughs> I, go ahead. <laughs> um, I think that one of the themes I guess I want to close off with is, um, or the two themes are risk and justice. And I think that there is a lot of risk at play for yourselves in these leadership positions uh, within these organizations. And it can be scary to think about um, doing things differently because it does mean being vulnerable and it means giving up power. In, in different ways, and that's in terms of wealth, it's also in terms of um, just other aspects of your uh, identities in, in these spaces and this work. Um, but to always remember that there's risk on the other sides as well. Um, every time, if we're talking about youth specifically or you're talking about marginalized communities, every time that we're interacting with your organizations, there are huge risks at play for us as well. Um, and so I think that we need to meet in the middle and be vulnerable in how we don't know what the answers are all of the time. Um, it's messy. And if we actually are, again, trying to advance justice, if that is truly what we're trying to do with the reallocation of resources through this work, then that vulnerability is key and supporting each other in um, that risk taking and trust building together is important. Um, but again, through a lens of equity, acknowledging that that's not just, we're not on the same um, levels of risk, they look different. Um, and then maybe again, my other key word today was around love. And so just a reminder of, um, I saw someone share something beautiful on there about the power of love and what that can do. Um, actually, it's right there. So yes to love, it's power, it is the essence. If we foundations learn and lead from love, we cannot help but see our work, wealth, privilege differently. 
So lead from love and also um, respect the power of love that's coming from the communities that you're not a part of and know that we need the resources to do justice to uh, our communities and the work that we're trying to do. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks. This was really, this was a really great conversation. So I appreciate uh, being hosted this way. Um, I'm, I just want to reflect on the language of impatience. Is what I was um, thinking about, and I think it's it's important to recognize. Um, I think it's more about urgency. I think it's recognizing that there are some ways in which we've we've come far, absolutely, and there are ways in which some some issues are getting worse, as we know, right? And so I think it's important to yes, recognize that this work is long and hard, and then also that it is absolutely urgent. So I think um, I think it's. <laughs> yeah, not about I, I like cha like knocking it all down, but uh, I think it is about ha asking some of those hard questions that maybe we don't have answers to in this moment, mm -hmm. but uh, grappling with them together. Um, I think someone said it was a cultivated discomfort in the comments, so I appreciate that. I think this was uh, successful if it if it felt uh, like a like a comfort a discomfort that was um, fruitful. Um, because yeah, I think this work is absolutely urgent and, and calls for uh, perhaps a healthy amount of impatience if we want to use that, that word. Thank you. I want to build on this particular piece around the, the challenge of grappling with questions that we don't necessarily have answers to in this moment. Um, so we, we raised a lot of really big questions and we, we provided a few nuggets of sort of concretely what could this look like and, and how can transition happen. Um, and there's, there's a bunch of answers that we, that we still don't have. Um, and uh, one thing that I, I wanna, I guess, lift up is in the spirit of what I think was a brilliant choice on the part of the PFC conference organizers to bring in folks from the European context, uh, I wanna remind us that there, there are people around the world doing this work uh, and who have made incredible progress on this work and that we can learn from them. Um, and, and so one, one network that I want to name is the, the EDGE Funders Alliance, Engaged Donors for Global Equity. This is a, a global member association of foundations that are committed to social justice philanthropy, uh, addressing the root causes of inequality, shifting power, um, and they do incredible work to, like I was saying before, bring those of us who have access to these resources together so we can hold each other and learn well, and, and take up some of that burden ourselves. And so I, I, I wanna yeah, make sure that you know, we, we end this conversation having heard some really important framing, really important reframing, critique, having heard a bunch of energy and, and emphasis on the importance of, of love and dialogue and care, um, and also feeling like even if we don't have answers to all these questions, we know some places where we can look right now to, to get them. And so, yeah, thank you again so much to the three of you for, for being a part of this. And thank you all.